Praise the Lord. God got a blessing with our name on it. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God for the songs of ministry. Hey, praise God for vision. Praise God. The praises of God's people. God's got a blessing. God got many blessings. Many blessings with our name on it. Many blessings. It's a blessing even to be right here this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. God be the glory. We're praying for all who are sick and shut in and bereaved. God has blessings for you. With your name on it. Let's give God the praise. Let's give God the praise. Amen. Hallelujah. All the sick and shut in. Bereaved families. It's time now to hear what God has to say through his word this morning. From the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 7. We invite you to turn in your worship bulletin to the word for this morning, the insert word for the New Living Translation Bible. After we've read the key verses prayerfully, I'm afraid we shall sing hymn of preparation. In times like these, guide me, O oh, thy great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. The key verse is out of chapter 12, and chapter, chapter 7, that is, of the book of Ecclesiastes. It's first of all, verse 12. Verse 12. Let us read prayerfully together verse 12 from the New Living Translation. Wisdom and money can get you almost anything, but only wisdom can save your life. Verse 14. Enjoy prosperity while you can, but when hard times strike, realize that both came come from God. Remember that nothing is certain in this life. In chapter 8, verse 1, let us read the third key verse. How wonderful to be wise, to analyze and interpret things. Wisdom lights up a person's face, softening its harshness. Verse 12, again, we find... Wisdom and money can get you almost anything, but only wisdom can save you. Verse 14, again, strong verse. Enjoy prosperity while you can. But when hard times strike, realize that both come from God. Remember that nothing is certain in life. Obtaining wisdom for life. The message this morning, obtaining wisdom for life. How wonderful to be wise, to analyze and interpret things. Wisdom lights up a person's face, softening its hardness, a harshness, I should say. Our Father, we thank you for your word this morning and we thank you for your people on this Lord's Day. Now take control of this mortal vessel of mine and the vessel of thy people who are worshiping in person as well as by live streaming, that you might be in total control, that you might, our Father, have our hearts, our minds, our wills, our emotions, that we might listen by the power and aid of the Holy Spirit to your eternal and unchanging word for the times in which we live. We know, thy Father, that your word is, our Father, our life. Your word is our instruction. Your word is wisdom. Your word is understanding. You said in all of our getting, get wisdom, get understanding. Speak to every heart. Speak to our hearts this morning and 
the ways in which each worshiper needs our Father to hear from you. We pray, our Father, that you will bless the, the, these who are saved and bless those, our Father, who are not saved. We are praying for salvation to come to the whole human race, if it be thy will. For you died on the cross, that whosoever believeth in you will not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you that everlasting life is free for those who place that trust in the only true and wise God, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Hear our prayers, O oh Lord, even the unspoken petitions that are on our hearts. For we ask it all in the matchless name of Jesus the Christ. And for his sake, we all pray in the church said, Amen. Amen. Guide me, O Thou great Jehovah. people who love the Lord and his words said amen. Amen. Let me begin this message this morning with this quote that I want to and I'm led to and was led to by the Lord to share with you from this text written by a Christian theologian in the person of Thomas A. Kempis, who wrote many centuries ago these words. 
for our hearing, for our understanding. Through lightness of heart, he wrote, and small concern for our failings, we become insensible of the sorrows of the souls. But oftentimes we vainly or fruitlessly laugh when justly we ought to weep for the failings of our heart. There is, he continues, no true liberty or right joy but in the fear of God, in the respect of God, in the esteem of God, in the exaltation of God, in the reverence of God, in the acknowledgement of God, and in the worship of God. There is, there is no respect, esteem, exaltation. but in the fear of God, accompanied with a good conscience. I want you to say that, accompanied with a good conscience. A good conscience. Again, through lightness, through levity of heart, and small concern for our failings, we become insensible as human beings of the sorrows of our souls. But oftentimes, fruitlessly, we laugh when we just ought to weep. Then he closes his thoughts by noting there is no true liberty, no true liberty, or right joy, but in the fear of God accompanied with a good conscience. My brothers and sisters, our text today continues on that note because these words are true with some related themes that we have uh, and we find throughout the remaining chapters of the book of Ecclesiastes, chapters 8 through 12. Today, beginning with chapter 7, but these are themes today and messages today and messages throughout the remainder of the book of Ecclesiastes that we should take note of as we continue our journey in this series through the book of Ecclesiastes. In, our, in an overview of our text from Ecclesiastes chapter 7, it has been noted that wisdom does not always work out immediately. I want you to say that wisdom does not always work out immediately. It doesn't always work out immediately in the world we live in that has been cursed by God, from the fall of Adam, the fall of man, in the Garden of Eden, according to Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 through 18, a curse that will not be lifted up until, according to Revelation chapter 20, 22, verse 3, the curse will finally be lifted on this earth. But because of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, wisdom does work out ultimately. I want you to say that wisdom does work out ultimately. Dr. Daniel L. Atkins and Jonathan Atkins, in an overview of that book entitled Christ-Centered Exposition Exalting Jesus in Ecclesiastes, points out that King Solomon has the shaky problem here of unbelief in the book of Ecclesiastes. He's standing on shaky ground with belief. The author specifically records he is teetering on the edge of unbelief because of the mess he sees the world in. Solomon observes that living by God's wisdom does not always work out. The faithful often suffer. I want you to say that the faithful often, often suffers. And the wicked often prosper in this world. This situation is futile in Solomon's opinion. 
It's vanity. It's pointless. Therefore, Solomon takes on the role of a skeptic in order to watch the, and observe the world and to ask the question as he's watching and observing this world as we are today, is there meaning in this cursed world? I want you to raise that question. Is there meaning in this cursed world? Ask yourself the question. Lord, is there meaning? Is there purpose for me being here in this cursed world? King Solomon's, his experiment causes him to conclude that everything is meaningless, vanity, pointless, empty, vexation. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7 through chapter 11, he observes the unjust nature of things. And he concludes again that everything is absurd. However, of this, uh, instead of this moving him away from God, it actually drives him. What's happening to him and what's happening in the world? It actually drives him to God in faith. The question I want to ask is, in all that's happening today in the world, are you drawing, are you drawing closer to God in faith? Or are you lukewarm? Have you left the, your first love? Are you guilty of what Dr. Stanley, who has gone on to heaven, calls casual Christianity? Are you lukewarm or are you cold? but still singing, I'm on the battlefield for the Lord. My friends, in our text today, there are several truths King Solomon lifts up out of this text as to why this world is not meaningless. When he acknowledges that God is sovereign, God is preeminent, God is God, God is the great I am. God is in control. God has no beginning, no ending. God has always existed. <laughs> and so Solomon says, because God is in control, I've got to press on towards a deeper faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, despite what I see and the mess that I see that's happening in the world. I wish I had a praying church. There are several truths. The first truth lifted up in our text according to verses 1 through 14 is that God has a design for everything in creation. I want you to say that God has a design for everything in creation. And the wisdom literature calls living according to that design wisdom. When we live according to the design of God, the creator of God, it is wisdom. It is godly wisdom. It is the mind of God in action on the part of his creation. My friends, before reading these first 14 verses, we should jot down and, and take special, special note of the fact that these verses emphasize the reality on the subject of prosperity and adversity. Uh, First of all, that God ordains both kinds of entities. He ordains adversity and he ordains prosperity. He, he, he ordains both kinds of days. He allows and permits both kinds of situations to happen in life. With the, with the knowledge of the future, God allows this because he is omniscient. He, he knows all things. And I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, thank God. God knows all things. Amen. He knows just how much you can bear. He knows just how much we can take. He knows the beginning from the end for every human being. He knows whether or not we are listening to him 
on a regular basis? Are we a prodigal in our listening? He knows. He knows sinners who think they are saved. I wish I had a praying church. He knows the saved who doubt if they are saved. He knows. Let the church say hallelujah. hallelujah. Now please read with me verses 1 through 14. Prayerfully, as God speaks to us through his word, through the Holy Spirit who gives us illumination, understanding, and, uh, in, and, and interpretation. Let's read. A good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume. And the day you die is better than the day you're born. Better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies, so the living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. A wise person thinks a lot about death while a fool thinks only about having a good time. Better to be criticized by a wise person than to be praised by a fool. A fool's laughter is quickly gone, like thorns crackling in a fire. This also is meaningless. Extortion turns a wise person into fools, and bribes correct the heart. Finishing is better than starting. Patience is better than pride. Control your temper, for anger labels you a fool. Don't long for the good old days. This is not wise. Wisdom is even better when you have money. Both are a benefit as you go through life. Wisdom and money can get you almost anything, but only wisdom can save your life. Verse 13. Accept the way God does things, for who can straighten what he has made crooked? Verse 14, enjoy prosperity while you can, but when hard times strike, realize that both come from God. Remember that nothing is certain in this life. Now, my friends, in going deeper into understanding uh, the text, Verses, 14, verses 1 through 14, King Solomon's description of the wisdom of seeking God in life rather than worldly pleasure. I want us to take note of the thoughtful comments, timely comments of, the, of our lo, uh, uh, friend who's long been with the Lord, Dr. Wiersbe, Warren Wiersbe, who many theologians and Bible scholars quote often in their preaching and teaching. Warren Wiersbe remarks on the subject of the better life that the better life involves some bitter things. I want you to say that the better life involves some bitter things, such as sorrow and rebuke, but the bitter things can make your life better. We need to hear that. We need to accept that. The bitter things can make our lives better. Have you experienced some bitter things in life? Yes. Let the church say yes. Has it made your life better? In walking with God, you ought to be able to say yes. Yes. He goes on to note and continues, on the day of your birth, you were given a name. On the day of your death, that name will be either putrid, which means repulsive or vile or sickening, or your name will be fragrant depending on how you live. Dr. Wisby continues his comments, noting, if you have a good name, your death will be better than your birth because nothing will be able to hurt your name. I want you to say that nothing will be able to hurt my name. In that sense, the end is better than, than the beginning. According to verse 8 of our text, sorrow and rebuke can teach us a lesson that will not be learned in any other way. We have to experience sorrow. We have to experience, amen, trials and troubles, defeats. We have to experience bitterness. We have to experience the negatives of life in order to be made better. 
We must accept that. That's God's word. If you turn quickly to Proverbs chapter 27, hold your hand in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, Proverbs chapter 27, you'll find in reading the King James translation, I will read from the New Living Translation, chapter 27 of Proverbs, verse 4 through 6, uh, we find these words. Verse 4, we find the words, anger is cruel and wrath is like a flood. But jealousy is even more dangerous. Verse 5, an open rebuke is better than hidden love. And verse 6 of Proverbs 27 records, wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. And in verse 12 of Proverbs chapter 27, we find these words. A prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. A simpleton. Now friends, as we reflect even further on this first truth, author, Bible scholar, and theologian, Dr. R. Albert Moeller, Jr., has given these comments that are worth our hearing, taking note of on the text, verses 1 through 14. He observes, life does not always present us with only one obviously right path to take. I want you to repeat those words. Somebody needs to hear that. Life does not always present us with only one path, right path to take. We come to crossroads. We come to crossroads. Throughout life, we come to crossroads. And in every crossroad, the question is, oh God, which road should I take? And for some of us, we know those crossroads come all the time. Can I get a witness? Sometimes, several times in a given day. Can I get a witness? Life, he says, does not always present us with only one obviously right path to take. Instead, we must deeply discern which path is better than the other. It takes wisdom to see, for example, that hardship can be better than fun. Having fun and parties, according to the first six verses. Just taking hardship rather than going out and partying. We might grow more from the hardships and the pain of a funeral than from the ease of the fun of a party. One thing about a funeral, it brings everybody back to their senses. Mortality and immortality. Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? We're here today and gone today. And the funeral is three days later. Can I get a witness? But we are certainly not helped along our way by yielding to this world's corruption, according to verse 7, and patience according to verse 8, touchiness according to verse 9, and nostalgia according to verse 10, the pain of a funeral than from the ease of the front of the party. We are certainly not helped alone our way by yielding to this world's corruption. Wisdom helps the way uh, an insurance policy helps, uh, Mola notes. But wisdom is better than money. Above all, let's remember that in good times and bad times, it is the sovereign God we always are dealing with. I don't care what's going on in my life or your life. We're always dealing with a sovereign God. Many people want God to get away, go away. <laughs> but God is right here, even now, with us worshiping. I wish I had a praying church. <laughs> he knows whether or not we're receiving or we're rejecting. His word. Can I get a witness? How many of you know that? Hold your hand up and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. He knows. Yes. 
You can't push God out of your life. He's there all the time. Mola closes his comments saying, enduring pain that we cannot remedy and facing the outcomes we cannot predict. In verses 13 and 14, he says we are wise to stay humble before God. In enduring pain, in situations we cannot change, in situations that are beyond our control, in, in situations that are getting, growing worse and worse and worse. Can I get a witness? In situations where we can't predict what's going to happen from one moment to the next, it is wise for us to stay humble, stay on our knees, stay in prayer, and leave the results to God. <laughs> I wish I had a prayer in church this morning. <laughs> because God hears and answers the fervent prayers of a righteous man or woman. Can I get a witness? My friends, at this point of the message, it is important to properly hear the devotional message of another great man of God who's gone on to be with the Lord, Ray Steadman, who writes on uh, his thoughts on the key verse, verse 14. And his remarks are like this. Prosperity and adversity both come from God's hands. A wise father's heart has given them to you. Whatever those adversities are, God has given them to us. Those prosperity situations, he's given them to us. In the words of the hymn, he goes on to note, day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I have no cause to worry or to fear. King Solomon has given all the event, it says God has given to us the, all the events that we, we face, whatever we're facing, as individuals, as a family, as a congregation, as the church universal, as a world that, where people have lost their way, where people are sin sick and need a savior. Can I get a witness? God has given all events to us. Thus we must learn to accept and understand that God has chosen these for us out of love and out of wisdom. They have a special, special place and a special purpose. God has designed life to be full of the unexpected so that we might realize that we do not control anything. We do not control the future. We do not control the future. There are some people who are guilty of trying to control people and control everything. Can anybody say amen? There are people who have to be in charge. They have to be lauded, lifted up, even worship. Can I get a witness this morning? But God has designed life to be full of the unexpected. In praying this morning and in praying other times, we hear those prayers because every day, in our nation and in the streets of our cities and in the streets of our countries, our nations and our world, there is something troubling. Can I get a witness? Displacements, the breaking up of families. Can I get a witness? Famine and diseases. Can I get a witness? Amen. Amen. People, well, many are blessed to have just about everything they want. There are many who are crying out just for crumbs from the table. God has designed life, Christians, to be full of the unexpected. That we might, as a people, realize that we are not in control 
of anything. We are not in charge of life. The great satanic lie is noted that suddenly comes at us a thousand times a day is that we are gods. We are small letter gods. We can fix things. We in charge. I'll handle this. Can I get a witness? I'll take care of this. Oh, you will? I can hear God. If God could speak to us sometime, he'll say, oh, you think you can take care of this? Can I get a witness this morning? And sometimes he'll say, I'll let you take care of it. And when you come to the realization that you cannot take it anymore, I'll be right there. We can plan, we can direct, we can control. Amen. We think. Because within the freedom of will that God has granted us, there appears to be some, some truth to that. Thus, we easily believe the rest, that we are in ultimate control of everything. But the lesson is that this is not true. Only God is in charge of this cosmos. Only God is in charge of this universe. Only God is in charge of Mother Earth. Only God is in charge of the United States of America. Give God the praise right now. And every other nation on this planet, he's in control. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. He's worthy to be praised. He's in control. Why are we fretting about everything? Lord, help me to preach this morning. Why, why, why are we all hung up on what's going on in the news? And Jesus says, I've given you a commandment. Go make disciples. But you've been distracted by human beings. I wish I had a prayer church. You're worried about your income. The earth is the Lord's. <laughs> Can I get a witness? You're worried about food. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to me. Can I get a witness? You're worried about housing. God says, I am your refuge and strength. Psalm 46. A very present help in the time of trouble. Is there a witness this morning that can raise your hand and say, yes, Lord. He's in charge. The church needs to wake up. I'm talking about churches all over this country and the world. God is in charge. Where there's much prayer, there's much power. God will say, okay, you want me to handle it? I'll handle it. Whatever is wrong, he can make it right. In his own way, in his own time. What he sends to us is always designed to benefit us. This is a clear teaching of the scripture, both in the Old Testament and New Testament. Even though adversity may have painful aspects, we ought to understand that it comes from a loving God and a great, and, and we ought to be grateful that it comes from a loving God. An unknown poet is on record saying this, God wants, when God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man, when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns with all of his heart to create so great and bold a man, that all the world shall be amazed. Watch his methods, watch his ways, how he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects, how he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay, which only God understands. While his tortured heart is crying, he lifts beseeching hands, how he bends but never breaks. When it's good, he undertakes. How he uses whom he chooses, with, with every purpose, with every purpose, fuses, fuses him. By every act, induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. God knows. I want you to say that God knows what he's about. Now secondly, secondly, 
in our text from verses 15 through 24. King Solomon lifts up the truth that all have sinned. All have sinned. To put it another way, every human being is guilty of the sins of omission and commission. All have sinned. I want you to say all have sinned. Thus, with a deep awareness of our sinfulness, we receive clarity and wisdom and our recognition of a need for God's amazing grace. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 89 says, by grace we are saved through faith and not of ourselves it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man a woman should boast. Grace is a gift to those who surrender their life, their all in all, their mind, their intellect, their emotions, and yes, yes, their will to God. He gives them salvation. Salvation. And it's eternal. You don't have to worry about the future. You don't have to worry about death. And you don't have to worry about the hereafter. For when the battle of life is over, we shall wear a crown. The crown of life in New Jerusalem. Please read with me now, verses 15 through 24. As we recognize in these verses the, the limits of human wisdom. Let's read. I have seen everything in this meaningless life, including the death of good young people and the long life of wicked people. Stop there. Stick a pin there. This is King Solomon. Many centuries ago, which tells us nothing is new under the sun. Let's read it again. I've seen everything in this meaningless life, including the death of good young people and the long life of wicked people. So don't be too good or too wise. Why destroy yourself? On the other hand, don't be too wicked either. Don't be a fool. Why die before your time? Pay attention to these instructions, for anyone who fears God will avoid both extremes. One wise person is stronger than 10 leading citizens of a town. Not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. Don't eavesdrop on others. You may hear your servant curse you, for you know how often you yourself have cursed others. Verse 23, let's read. I have always tried my best to let wisdom guide my thoughts and actions. I said to myself, I am determined to be wise, but it didn't work. Stick a pin there. I determined to be wise. I, but it didn't work. Let's read on. Wisdom is always distant and difficult to find. Now, my friends, properly listen, it's been noted that wisely that we have so much brokenness in the world. The wise must avoid the pitfalls, the pitfalls and snares that are always around us. Satan makes sure of that. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and on. Against rulers of this dark world, spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. And he uses people who open themselves up to be used by Satan and his demons. That's with much brokenness in the world. The wise must avoid pitfalls around them, all around them. Doing the thing, doing the right thing doesn't guarantee success. According to verse 15, always doing the right thing doesn't guarantee success. 
Therefore, we might be tempted by two opposite extremes, according to the scriptures that we just read. David Moore and Atkins in their book, Ecclesiastes, with their timely comments have declared, Solomon is warning us that we should be careful not to believe we are righteous apart from God. We are not righteous apart from God. We are sinners. I want us to say that I am a sinner apart from God. He goes on to know, they go on to know in their, in, their, in, their, in, their, in their comments. Trying to curtail our badness through the energy of the flesh will produce self-righteousness. Trying to be good in our own strength is not only exhausting, it's impossible. Furthermore, righteousness, even the godly variety, ought always to be in conjunction, a tandem, with mercy and kindness. Just because the wicked may prosper shouldn't lead us to conclude that their lifestyle is preferable. This is a false deduction. And Solomon addresses this in verses 18. In verse 18, he goes on to note there are a couple of truths. These writers, Atkins, Amen. Acknowledge there are a couple of truths to keep in mind. First, we are not to view ourselves as righteous apart from God. The other is not to cave in to worldliness simply because it looks like it's like an easier thing to do. But how do we hold on? The question is raised. How do we hold to our faith? How do we press on? and seek and pray for the wisdom of God, the mind of God, and the, the, the illuminations of God. Uh, uh, the, he, he goes on to note the answer is clear. The fear of God is cited as the motive in Scripture to stay away from, uh, is cited as the answer. Uh, Fearing God keeps us from pride in our own righteousness and it motivates us to stay away from wickedness. The fear of God. Do you fear God? Do we fear God? Do we respect God? Do we understand God is holy? Do we understand that God is pure? And God demands that we be holy as he is holy? He commands it. Be ye holy is recorded over in Peter. As I am holy. How, Lord? Apart from me, you can't do nothing, God says. But when you respect me, you will come to me. When you respect me, you will seek me. When you respect me, you will call on my name. You will pray, and you will pray and pray until you get a prayer through. You will not become impatient with me. The Bible says, they that wait, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Do I have any believers here that can say amen? They shall mount up with wings as an eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach us, Lord, the songwriter wrote. Teach us, Lord, how to wait. Master, teach us how to wait. Wisdom. We, we're big in his thoughts on the subject of a balanced life, the balanced life. I always said the balanced life. Do you have a balanced life? A balanced life. Do you have a balanced life today? He, he knows God gives both prosperity and adversity, and he knows how much and how long. Instead of peering into the future, according to verse 14, live in the present and learn to profit from both pain and profit from pleasure. Learn lessons from both. 
I want you to flip quickly over to Philippians. Hold your hand in Ephesians, I'm sorry, in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Flip over to Philippians chapter 4. Chapter 4. Paul learned the lesson. He had a balanced life. Paul grew in, in spiritual balance. Can I get a witness? He was extreme at one time before he was saved. He was, on a, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Can I get a witness? But he was saved. And when he became saved, he took off. Can I get a witness? And he had an experience that he was, and he was caught up in the third heaven that he could not talk about. Can I get a witness? God was preparing him for a journey whereby ultimately he would suffer and die for his faith. Over in Philippians chapter, chapter 4, I want you to read verses 10 through 13. Uh, uh, prayerfully, as I read aloud, Paul thanks God for the gifts. He says, how I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content. I have learned how, how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me the strength. I can do everything. God gives both prosperity and adversity, and he knows how much and how long. Thus, instead of peering into the future, we are to live in the present and learn how to profit from whatever we're going through. Profit by it. And as we profit by it, we share what we've learned with others who are struggling in the same, in the same like manners. In verses 16 through 17 of the text that we've read, Solomon did not suggest that you play it safe and get the best of both worlds. The tenses of the verbs in the Hebrew give the meaning, do not claim to be righteous and wise. You are still on the way and have not arrived yet. That is why God balances your life with trials and troubles and tribulations as well as victories and triumphs to keep us from getting too proud of ourselves. And saying, I made it, I made it. By the, I made it on my own. Nobody helped me. I did it all myself. Can I get a witness? There are people who talk like that in 2023. Even in the church. Y'all saying amen, mm -hmm, but it's amen. Amen. Now let us know the third truth. Verses 25 through chapter 8, verse 1 in our text today. It is that, and that third truth is that wisdom may seem elusive. Yes. It may seem difficult to find, to catch, yes. or to achieve. Yes. But the gospel of our Lord allows us to recover yes. from the strongholds of sin yes. and to pursue God's wise design. God helps us to pursue his design. Read with me. Verses 25 through 29. I, 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 let's read together. I searched everywhere, determined to find wisdom and to understand the reason for things. I was determined to prove to myself that wickedness is stupid and that foolishness is madness. I discovered that a seductive woman is a trap more bitter than death. Her passion is a snare and her soft hands are chains. Those who are pleasing to God will escape her but sinners will be caught in her snare. This is my conclusion, says the teacher. Discover this after looking at the matter from every possible angle. angle. Though I have searched repeatedly, I have not found what I was looking for. Only one out of a thousand men is virtuous, but not one woman. But I did find this. God created people to be virtuous, but they have each turned to follow their own downward path. Now let's read chapter 8, verse 1. Uh, chapter 8, verse 1. How wonderful to be wise, to analyze, and to interpret things. Wisdom lights up 
a person's face, softening is harshness. Now, as I prepare to close, it's important to take note and hear the comments of, first of all, Dr. Evans, Tony Evans, on these last verses, verses 23 through 8, verse 1. Evans notes, whatever your life experiences, they don't match Solomon's. I want you to say that, whatever my life's experiences, they do not match Solomon's experiences. And as someone whom God blessed with profound wisdom, he can truly say, I tested all this by wisdom, according to verse 23. Yet all his study, all his investigation, didn't secure for him an answer to life's ultimate questions, according to verse 24 and 28. The answer to life can't be discovered in life. Under the sun, it's, it's best to live wisely. Foolishness is madness. Although God made people upright, they pursue many schemes and mischief, according to verse 29. Humanity wandered from God. Evil proliferated. And the world suffers today, even today. But a person's wisdom brightens his face <laughs> where there's a glow. All things being equal, wise living delivers happiness resulting from good decisions. Good decisions. And then, more specifically on verses 28 and 29, again, the Bible scholar of all the scholars that I read for this particular verses, where's the notes? We must not, as believers, think because of this message in verses 28 and 29. And let's read 28 and 29 again to be clear. Verse 28 and 29, let's read it again. Though I have searched repeatedly, I have not found what I was looking for. Only one out of a thousand men is virtuous, but not one woman. But I did find this. God created people to be virtuous, but they have each turned to follow their own downward path. Wisby says, we must not think, brothers and sisters, because of this passage that Solomon rated women as less than or less intelligent than men. Because this is not the case. King Solomon spoke highly of women in Proverbs chapter 12, Verse 4, chapter 14, verse 1, chapter 18, verse 22, chapter 19, verse 14, chapter 31, verse 10. He goes on to, to note Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter 9, verse 9, and certainly in the Song of Solomon, in the book of Proverbs, Solomon even pictured God's wisdom as a beautiful woman. According to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20, and Proverbs chapter 8, verse 1, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 1. Then he cautions, he says, remember that women in Solomon's day had neither the freedom nor the status that they have today. And for a woman to have learning equal to that of a man in Solomon's day would be unusual. For women to rule over the land was considered in Solomon's day a judgment of God. According to Isaiah chapter 3, Verse 12, but we must remember the Old Testament women such as Miriam. Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? Moses' sister, Deborah, the judge, Queen Esther, who says, I'm going to see the king. And if I perish, 
to, 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 to speak up for my people, I'll perish. Can I get a witness? Old Testament women who had great leadership and ability were used and are cited in the Old Testament. Let the church say hallelujah. hallelujah. Yes, he goes on to note, this evil world has many snares and many temptations, but a person with godly wisdom will have the power to overcome the snares, overcome the evil, overcome, amen, uh, amen, that which is out of order. Wisdom will have the power to overcome it all. Solomon has proved his point. In this chapter, wisdom can make our lives better, clearer, and stronger. We may not fully understand all that God is doing, but we will have enough wisdom to live for the good of others and for the glory of God until he calls us from labor to reward. As I close, there is a marvelous description on the benefits of wisdom, of what happens to one who discovers the true wisdom of righteousness as a gift from God, one who walks with God in the fear of God. First of all, if you're taking notes, first of all, wisdom will make a person a unique human being. Jot that down. Wisdom will make a person a unique human being. Wisdom. You'll stand out among the crowd, no matter where you are, how you dress, a wise man, wise woman, young men, young woman, wise teenagers, teen, yes, wise children will stand out. Wisdom, wisdom will make a person a unique. And the question is asked, who is like the wise man? One of the, the follies of life is to try to imitate somebody else. And we have a lot of people who are trying to imitate other folk today. Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? The media constantly bombards us with invitations that are even subtle to look like, dress like, or talk like some popular idol. If you succeed in that, or the news is that when you become a new creature in Christ Jesus, you will be unique. You, you will you become more and more like Christ, but unlike everyone else in, pers in, pers in personality, you will not be a copy, cheap imitation, but an original from the Spirit of God. If you succeed, of course you will be nothing but a cheap imitation of another person if you're trying to imitate people. Let me ask you, are you trying to imitate anybody? Or are you living for Christ? and asking him to mold and shape you, shape us after his will. While we're waiting, yielding, and still. For however many years we've been living, and however many years we have been yielding ourselves to Christ, what kind of progress has he made with us? Do we look more and more like him? Or do we look more and more like the world? Secondly, King Solomon says, God in verse, in, in particular ver, in chapter 8, verse 1, godly wisdom will give you a secret knowledge. Uh, the question is raised, who knows the explanation of things? The implication of that question is that the wise person knows. Paul declares in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the spiritual man makes judgments about all things. Chapter 2, verse 15, a portion. Spiritual people are in a position to pass moral judgment, moral judgment on the value of everything. Not because they're so smart, but because God who teaches them is wise. God makes us wise. God makes us discern. God makes us to understand right from wrong, good from evil. Can I get a witness? That which is appropriate from that which is out of place. That which is godly from that which is ungodly. Let the church say amen. amen. And thirdly, such a person will experience joy when they have wisdom. Wisdom brightens a man's face according to verse 1 of chapter 8. Grace 
not Greece. Grace, not Greece, is what makes the face shine. I want you to say grace, not Greece, is what makes the face shine. Let the church say hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Manufacturers put grease on cosmetics to make the face shine artificially. But it is grace that does, does this from within. Grace and joy that results from it visibly expressed by a face shining from the grace of God. When people look at you, do they see the grace of God in your face? Or do they see gloom and doom? Sadness and sorrow. I started to say something, but I won't. One of the things about preaching is when you preach in the spirit, God doesn't allow you to focus at the faces of people. Because in too many churches, if you focus at the face of people, you will sit down and stop preaching. <laughs> Can I get a witness this morning? Thank you for your smiles. God bless all of you. <laughs> Finally, wisdom changes the inner disposition of a person. Wisdom changes its, its, its hard appearance. Wisdom. H have you ever watched somebody whose life is being changed? They're growing in grace. They used to have a rough looking countenance. Amen. They, they were rough in speech. They were rude. Can I get a witness? They didn't know the graces, even how to say thank you. But they're growing in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And every day you see them, you see the grace of God exuberating, amen, a amen, amen, going forth out of their life, out of their faces, out of their minds. You hear their talk, their, they, they, you hear their thinking, you hear their summaries. You understand that they are walking with God. God is in them. He's walking with them. It's good. Somebody said it. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus. I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me. And he's the one I'm living for. Every day with Jesus. It's sweeter than the day before. Is that your testimony? Then say yes. yes. Amen. All of us. I've heard the, heard the story of John Newton. He was a slave trader. Yes. Amen. But early in his life, God had, a, had him to have a godly mother. A mother who prayed for him and prayed for his life. Yes. Can I get a witness? As soon as, as, as soon as he came of age, he joined the slave trade running slaves from Africa to England. He fell into wild living. He went into prodigal country, riotous living, involving himself. He was an alcoholic. He was drunken. He was always in fights because of his alcoholism. He ended up at last, as he himself confesses, as a slave of slaves actually serving some of the escaped slaves on the African coast. Wretched, miserable, and hardly even alive. When I read that story, I recognized and remembered the prodigal son who went out in riotous living, had all that he had, spent what his father had given him. His father thought he was going out too early but he thought he had come of age. Can I get a witness? There are a lot of young people today who think they've come of age. Can I get a witness? And they've gone out into prodigal, riotous country. And many of them are ended up, ending up in morgues, dead early, parting themselves to death, They're taking in innocently drugs, that are taking their lives out instantaneously. Can I get a witness? Some people that are 20 years old look like they are 50 years old because they're living rough lives, hanging around rough people, hanging around sinners, 
to make it even clearer, clearer hanging around Satan, a man infested people. Can I get a witness? Because the, the, the word of God says Satan is out to kill, steal, and destroy. And I stopped by to tell you he's doing, Lord have mercy, amen, a noticeable job of it. Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? It's troubling to me. It ought to be troubling to you. Can I get a witness? And some of you can testify, I've got some children out there. Or I've got some nieces and nephews who have lost their way. I'm praying for them. I beg them. I talk to them. I plead with them. Can I get a witness? I've done everything I could. I've given them what they wanted. It seemed like it's not enough. Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? But I'm still holding on and waiting for a change to come. Can I get a witness? And I stop by to tell you, a praying mother, a praying father, a prayers of a righteous availeth much. I stop by to tell you, don't stop praying. I said, don't stop praying. Don't stop looking up. Don't stop pleading. Because God is a God who may not come when you want him to. But he's always, always on time. On time. I said on time. Can I get a witness? He can stop that which is wrong in your family's life, your children's life, your grandchildren's life, your aunt's life, your uncle's life, your husband's life, your wife's life. Can I get a witness? He's an on time God. He can change your situation. He can turn your dilemma into celebration. Can I get a witness? Oh, it is no secret what God can do. Can I get a witness? What he's done for others, he'll do for you. Can I get a witness? Prayer, prayer, blessings, will come down. Uh, have anybody uh, experience uh, what I'm talking about? Uh, he's an on-time God. Uh, yes, he is. Uh, yes, he is. Uh, oh, Lord, have mercy. Uh, I stop by to tell you, uh, don't be quiet, uh, but let the world know uh, my God uh, is real. Uh, my God uh, is able. Uh, my God uh, is all wise. Uh, my God God uh, is sovereign. Uh, my God uh, is in control. Uh, my God, uh, my God uh, can do anything uh, but fail. Uh, can I get a witness? Uh, can I get a witness? Uh, Newton came to that uh, and he wrote to him, uh, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound uh, that saved a wretch uh, like me. Uh, is there a witness? Uh, can you stand on your feet uh, and declare I once was lost, uh, but now I'm found. Uh, was blind, uh, but now I see. Uh, through many dangers, uh, toils and snares, uh, I have already come. It was grace, grace, grace. Grace, uh, grace uh, that brought us uh, safe the far, uh, and grace, uh, God's grace, uh, will lead us on. Uh, aren't you glad? Uh, he has power, all power, all power, all authority. Heaven and earth uh, will pass away, uh, but my God, uh, He lives, He lives, He lives. Early one Sunday morning, uh, he arose uh, from the dead. Uh, can I get a witness? Christ rose from the dead with all power, all power, all power, all power. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Do you love him? Do you love Jesus? Then shout glory. Time is few 
for a swift transition. Help me to sing it. No. Christians, build, build your hopes. Church, home. Oh, remember, time, time is filled with swift transition. You better be real. Oh, believers, hold, hold on to God. Oh, I'm determined to hold. Hallelujah, God. In the morning, I'm a. In the evening, Bill. Oh, oh, remember to us, to us in the Him who will not leave you. Oh, whatsoever. He promised they will never pass away. Oh, I'm determined to hold to his. I'm going to hold on. Hold to your faith. I'm going to hold. And one day, one day, when your journey, when, when, when your journey is completed, God says it's time to come home. If heaven, stand bright, your home, he lights up the city. There's no night there. Nothing but day. Ah, I'm going to hold to his head. God, I'm going to hold. Oh, God, I'm going to build, build my hope on things eternal. Oh, Father, we thank you for your word. We pray, Master, if that be any this morning, in this sanctuary who are ready to commit that life to Christ who have not done so, we're praying that they will do so today. For you have reminded us, behold, now is the day of salvation. Behold, now is acceptable time. For tomorrow is not promise. Lord, you have told us, that while we have blood running along in our veins, we hear you. We're able to act on your hearing, hearing you. We are to respond. We are to take action. May those who are worshiping by live streaming do the same. While they are, wherever they are, may they pause right now. May they commit themselves right now to you. May they pray, pray the prayer of sinners asking you to forgive them of their sins, to cleanse them from all unrighteousness, to come into their life and save them because they believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, that you're God and that beside you there is no other. They believe that you came into the world, you died on the cross for their sins. 
they confess that you were buried as prophecy would have it. And they confess that on the third day morning you rose from the dead. Lord, may these who are worshiping by live streaming confess you as their hope, their only hope and their savior. And as they ask you to come into their life on the authority of your word, may they know you have come, you will come and you will save them and you will seal their souls until the day you come to claim them out of their mortal clay bodies and bring them into your presence. And one day, on that great day, when the trumpet shall sound, those who are in the graves, the, their body or their remains, the corruptible be, be, will be raised to incorruptible bodies. Those who are still walking around will be changed in a moment in the twinkle of an eye. And now glorified bodies will be caught up with their souls. And their souls and their new bodies will live together in your place, in your home, in heaven, where we will never grow. Oh, what a supernatural phenomena and what a supernatural reality you have shared and you have given to the New Testament church. Help us to know it is by faith, by grace and through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ we are saved. And it's not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. We are praying, our Father, that you will break the chains, the strongholds, the sins that have so gripped so many human, kind, human beings in our world. We are praying, our Father, that you will just do what no other power can do. If people are asking for deliverance, from their imprisonment to sin and to Satan. May they hear you. May they cry out to you. And may they know that you have heard them and you will come. You will break the chains. You will save them. You will set them on a new course. You will give them a new life. You will give them a new destiny. You have written their names in the Lamb Book of Life as they pray and ask you to come into their life. And they will be in heaven one of these old days celebrating with all the saints of the ages the glory and the majesty and the salvation of God our Savior. For we ask it all in the name of him who rules and who reigns even now. In the name of him who has always been and always will be God. In the name of our Savior who says I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me, in the name of Jesus the Christ, we offer up this prayer. And the church said, Amen. I'm going to hold to his hand. Oh, God. I'm going to hold to his hand. Yes, God. I'm determined to be. Church. great leader. Yes, Lord. And he's worth all of our praises. Yeah. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. This world affords today than to be a king in a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd 
rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. That's the testimony of every baptized believer. I'd rather have Jesus. Hold your hand up and say, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Praise God. Heavy low. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands of your home, who have not lifted up his soul to the vanity nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessings of the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your hands, O gates, and even lift them up. The everlasting doors and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. He is the King, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The King of glory. In the name of God the Father. So be it.